Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Don't Waste the Crisis. Uh, this is a webinar series that we started back in April for that we thought was going to be a quite lived uh, webinar series, at least we hoped. And this is co-sponsored by uh, Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment at ASU, as well as the International Association for the Study of the Commons and the Resilience Alliance. So back in April, we, we launched this webinar series, short-lived, just, just while COVID was around. And we had, uh, our first speakers were Brad Allenby and David Manuel Navarrete um, to talk with us. And we thought it'd be nice to revisit now that we've, uh, we've been living with uh, COVID-19 for a little while and are a little bit more acquainted with it. And wanted to see where their thoughts were at now, how they've changed over time, and 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 what they see uh, going forward. Uh, so, just a brief in the ways of introduction. Brad is a, a professor and an environmental scientist over in the School of uh, Sustainable Engineering at ASU, and David is a uh, faculty member at the School of Sustainability, also at ASU. I won't uh, go into all their qualifications at this point. Maybe it'll come up later. Um, just a reminder, uh, use the Q&A for any questions that you have, and we'll moderate those and bring those to uh, Brad and David's attention. Our um, speakers are going to talk for 8, 10, 12 minutes, something like that each, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into more of a dialogue. Without further ado, uh, Brad and David, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I think I'll, I'll start and I'm sharing a screen. I, I hope you can see my slides. So much has, uh, has happened since uh, uh, our last webinar. So I didn't know, you know, really where, where to start. But uh, what I'm going to do is to organize my uh, short statement as a Montreal cognitive test uh, question. So um, progress. You can repeat after me, or you can repeat that after. Progress, realities, precedent, TV. So let's start with progress. Uh, one could hypothesize after six months that countries with uh, holistic hierarchical ideologies responded better to COVID-19 than those with a more individualistic uh, um, ideology. The US, Brazil, Spain are highly individualistic and failing uh, dramatically to contain COVID-19, while China, South Korea, Vietnam are doing much better. And then you have countries like uh, New Zealand, Canada, or um, Germany that might be like a happy medium. What, what do I mean by holistic uh, hierarchical ideologies? I'm following here um, the French anthropologist, uh, the late uh, Louis Dumont, famous for his studies uh, about ca the caste system in India and his theories of modern individualism. And broadly speaking, for him, holistic hierarchical ideologies assume that the part, the individual, is uh, only has meaning in relation to the whole. In contrast, individualism takes each individual as a comprehensive, complete, independent moral being, right? Who is free, for instance, to decide whether to wear a mask of, or not. But the important point that I want to meet here is that modernity equates progress with the advancement of individualism. This is progress as we know it, uh, as we define it in Western uh, society and culture. And COVID, I, I would argue, is challenging this idea of progress. In fact, our, our, our peculiar Western way of defining progress was already deeply ch challenged be before COVID-19, but what what the virus is doing is to just highlighting and uh, making more visible uh, the internal contradictions of this idea of progress. Now, um, what internal contradictions I'm talking about, one way of framing these internal contradictions is, and I'm going to follow again my favorite uh, uh, contemporary philosopher, Byung uh, Chul Han, uh, one way of framing them is in terms of excess. Uh, what does Han mean uh, by excess? Excess is, is the necessary consequence of defining progress in terms of individualism. So the proposition here is that as we progress, 
along individualistic pathways, excesses we will multiply inevitably. So let me give you some examples. Uh, the, uh, the most, one of the most significant is the excess of achievement that uh, leads to this burn out society. Another good example is the excess of accumulation, which is leading to many things. Uh, amongst them, for instance, financial capitalism or also the dysfunctional healthcare um, system of the United States. Uh, another one is excess of egotism. And I think this is breeding um, a new form of totalitarianism. There are many others, and please use the chat to, to point out to your favorite excesses. One that I like a lot is the excess of, excess of merit, which I think is very relevant for, for academia. And uh, I would like to point to a recent book by Michael um, Sandel, who is at Harvard. He's a political scientist or philosopher. And in, in his book, the, the Tyranny of Merit, he, he talks about how this excess of merit is uh, dangerous, dangerously creating uh, a politics of humiliation and this culture of uh, the winner takes all and all that. But uh, in this presentation uh, or in this statement, I want to focus on a particular excess, the excess of positivity. Now, there is a lot we can learn from these excesses. Eventually, this learning may translate into redefining our Western ideas of progress. Hopefully, COVID-19 is already uh, putting some breaks in these excesses and giving us time, putting some perspective and all that. Uh, yet, this particular excess, excess of, of, of positivity, does not seem to be slowed down by, by COVID. And it's, the reason I want to, to focus on it and highlight it is because it's creating something that is very relevant for COVID and this country, which is parallel realities. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, Americans have uh, stopped to, to share a common view of reality, which takes us to the next point, realities, right? So the, the, immunity, to positi of, uh, the immunity of, of positivity to COVID is surprising because uh, some thought that the pandemic would take us back to reality, take us back to accepting the view of reality that science has so carefully constructed for us for centuries and all that. This was uh, supposed, this pandemic was supposed to be the time when science would uh, talk truth to power again and power would listen again. But this reality check that we were hoping for is not happening, at least not in the US or, or, or Brazil. The, the virus is not making science great again so uh, and and we can see this in terms of you know alternative facts fictional realities fake truths all seems to work fine in a pandemic or e even in a pandemic as long as one is willing to accept the 200,000 plus uh, deaths after all uh, it's, it is what it is right and so uh, except excess uh, of positivity and its ability to produce alternative uh, parallel realities is extremely resilient. And even climate change might not even affect it because, um, you know, I don't know, you, you have heard this new conspiracy theory that uh, the fires on the West Coast are apparently provoked by Antifa arsonists who want to make us believe that climate change is real, right? So, uh, why is this happening uh, and what should we do about it? And I'm going to leave these questions. I'm not going to try to answer these questions, but uh, perhaps uh, we can address them in the discussion. So the, the point is that the genesis of uh, and resilience of our excesses is a very complex phenomenon uh, that need to be explored in, in depth. And, uh, um, and, and, and my main larger point is that uh, the, all these excesses rely on the way we define progress. And unless or as long as we keep uh, defining progress in that way, we will keep hitting these thresholds or passing these thresholds. Which takes me to the next point, which is precedent. Can the president help in all this? Uh, first, it's I think obvious at this point that Trump is the king of excess. And uh, he's, but he's not coming from, from nowhere. Uh, he, he personifies perhaps one terminal stage of the individualistic uh, progress pathway that in which we are all involved. So uh, what I want here is to highlight uh, that uh, his transparency in terms of 
uh, embracing access might be showing us openly the dangers of keeping relying on our current definitions of progress. The second point I want to make is that uh, just getting rid of Trump will not solve much. Uh, it may give us some extra time, but Biden is not going to unite the country, I believe, or address the challenges, the real challenges that we need to face. It's unlikely that we start uh, all of a sudden sharing a common view of reality after, after November uh, 4th, independently of, of the outcome. So my point is that elections or the virus or even climate change uh, are not the solution to this ontological polarization. They, they might help, but, um, but what we need to do is to start accepting that we are no longer in a universe, we are in a pluriverse. And the question is how can we learn to live in this pluriverse without killing each other or engaging again in colonizing and, and, and subjugating each other, right? So my third point is that uh, uh, it's related to the previous ones. And uh, uh, Trump is, uh, as I was saying, very transparently exploiting access. And we don't know yet whether this will work for him or not. It's uh, working for him in the sense that uh, it's uh, gathering a lot of media attention. Um, huge presence in the media. Uh, we'll see whether that's enough to, to be to be reelected. But uh, uh, the, 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 the thing is that uh, we need to protect, learn to protect ourselves from his exploitation of access and also others' exploitations of access, probably more sophisticated and smarter ways of, of exploiting access. Which takes me to the final point, which is TV. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, we need to look out and away from our screens. That's, uh, this, must, this might sound painful, I don't know, for some people, not for me, but, but the fact is that addictions kill us, right? So, and, and Biden may, may help to, to make us this transition, but uh, we will need to actively redirect our gazes. And this is really the most important point that I want to make. Uh, we should not fall in the trap of uh, approaching uh, access or climate change as external threats or enemies. They are very different to COVID-19 in this sense. Another US uh, government, and, uh, the Democrat perhaps, may, may have fought the virus better, but the problem of access and climate change and these other issues must be addressed as neuronal, as systemic. So we are just uh, starting to realize the power digital technologies give us in terms of creating our own personal realities. Digital media is kind of rewiring us, changing the ways we act, perceive, feel, think, and live together without us being aware of it. The, uh, and the quarantine is, has for uh, an overdose of, of that, of, of lots of shit storms as well. And we are seeing how digital mediality works to the detriment of rest, respect. And to regain a sense of trust and respect for others, we need to disconnect, enter a diet to combat our media obesity, and only reconnect once we have become really good at rewiring ourselves. As social distancing comes to an end, hopefully it will come, I, I mean, surely will come eventually, we should walk away from our screens, to take a deep breath, slow down, end the spectacle, and explore together the re, uh, radical paradigm shift that digital media involves personally and collectively, and then we can perhaps re-engage with media in a more balanced way. So that's basically the similar message that I gave six months ago that, that hasn't changed much for me. So I will end um, with a new cognitive question. Commons realities, because they are not going to go, go away. We're not going to go back to the one reality, I think. Distance and respect. And with this, I will end. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Well, that's a hard act to follow, David. Um, so let me begin by taking another perspective. Um, the question I think that we have been struggling with for the last six months is what is COVID in terms of historical tides? Is it a flu that we simply 
uh, integrate into our existing patterns and manage? Or is it the Black Death that decimated China, uh, the Islamic world, and Europe in the 14th, 13th, and 14th centuries, resulting in massive change? Uh, had it lasted for a month, and then we all go back to partying, uh, I think uh, it wouldn't have changed that much. Six months of profound change, I think, means that we're looking at a Black Plague moment, not a flu moment. Uh, essentially, I think COVID is the horseman that brings upon us the proverbial French Revolution ending uh, the Enlightenment. Now, that sounds rather dramatic. And to be honest, it probably is. Uh, but think about the way that virtually all of our systems were on edge before COVID. Politics. In the, in the Enlightenment pluralistic West, politics was breaking down into uh, tribalism and internal civil war. Education. Everybody in education knows that teaching the same way we did in the 15th century uh, is not going to work. But it's such a huge system, nobody can change it. So education is on the edge. Work. We know that work is changing. Uh, AI is going to change it profoundly. Autonomous mechanisms built into the fabric of our economy are going to change what the world looks like. And we know this. What essentially is happening, happening is that COVID is the uh, catalyst by which the original Enlightenment fails, as it was already failing, and the industrial models behind it fail. So I'm going to run through a couple of slides really quickly uh, to the extent we want to bring them up. Uh, and in the discussion, we can do that. But the point I want to get across is that as David said, this is profoundly systemic, and we overlooked that at our peril. Now, I want to, before I start, reinforce the fact that everything I say about what might happen in the future is a scenario, not a prediction. None of us know what's going to happen in the future. Um, but we can see certain things that need to be thought about so that as things happen that we had no idea were going to occur, we can still respond somewhat effectively, we hope. All right, so in terms of resilience, what we have seen is an amazing display of resilience in some places and an amazing failure in other places. Resilience and efficiency are shown to be opposing values, that's a gross generalization, but in general, it is true because resilience is expensive. Resilience is also far more systemic than most of us, including most academics, have been willing to recognize. We had a lot of things in place in the United States, for example, that could have helped manage COVID. Incompetent federal leadership undermined all of those existing systems to produce a profoundly um, a uh, uh, vulnerable response to COVID. It's possible to invest efficiently in resilience. We didn't do it in part because we didn't understand that all of our investment was going to fail if leadership failed, and it did, and we were unprepared. But look at the other side of the coin. Uh, our physical infrastructure has, has performed in an outstanding manner. Most of us in the United States, again, I'm talking about the United States as an example. We can generalize this to global systems later. But most of us in the United States still get electricity, still get water, still get food, still have a functioning transportation system, still have fuel for our cars. In other words, the economic infrastructure performed outstandingly. Now, that's interesting because the economic infrastructure is one that many people want to tear down. So that's a caution. Tear it down, uh, uh, improve its performance in ways that we all know needs to happen. But be careful that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. 
economic. Well, UBI, I think, has been shown not to be impossible. Uh, it's certainly politically not yet uh, accepted, but we have demonstrated that in principle, UBI, the universal basic income, can work. The concept of the office is problematic. Now, if you think about it, what is New York City with tens of thousands of people working in finance, rushing in in the morning and rushing out in the evening? Well, it's a factory. The factory model is over. It's gone. A number of companies have already announced that their employees will be able to work from home. That's great. Now, what happens to the 17 trillion that's invested in the commercial property market? Um, and what happens to the jobs that were associated with that? They may have been service jobs, cleaning, uh, providing the food for all of those workers in, in urban areas, but they employed a lot of people. What's gonna be the impact of that change? And as far as employment goes, it's not just gonna be COVID. AI is gonna roll out on top of this because COVID infects people, it doesn't infect machines. So if I want to assure reliability of performance, COVID pushes towards investing in machines rather than people. That's I think an impact of COVID that we haven't thought about that combined with everything else going on in the world of work means that right now probably every university in the country is training people to be well employed in the 20th century and is clueless about how to train people to be employed in the 21st. In the United States, and this I think is true in other places as well, the, the impact of COVID and the gross mismanagement at the federal level have resulted in a fundamental shift of power from federal to state and corporate interests. Um, we all have ideological positions on this, but remember that, that the, uh, the more that gets perturbed as you do these fundamental shifts, the more you're liable to run into uh, unanticipated um, effects such as unrest uh, and, and local violence, failure of, of legal systems and so forth. To the extent we see anything going on at the corporate level, I suspect we're seeing uh, a more high-tech world. The rich get rich and the poor get poor. Uh, this is really something that we all ought to be more concerned about than we are. We all talk about, well, we have too much inequality and we've got to fix this and that, and we do. But the point is the world is going in the other direction in part because of COVID. And unless you're blind, the problem is that we're not doing enough to fix it. Education, for example, is failing, but it's primarily failing for the poorer students in poorer areas of the world. Um, the recent Economist, for example, talks about the impact of COVID on education in Latin America, which has been a problem with Latin America's development for a while. It's getting worse. Who is, uh, what groups are, is COVID being more problematic for in the United States? It's the poor students. It's the people of color. It's the, the communities that are already failing and COVID is pushing that further. A systematic response uh, is nowhere in sight. Uh, finally, uh, we fail to accept that privacy is a middle-class luxury good. And that the more that we cling on to privacy, the more we hurt the ability to respond effectively to things like COVID, which primarily impacts lower socioeconomic and minority communities that may not be nearly as worried about privacy as your suburbs are uh, in Scarsdale. Geopolitical. There's the assumption that when you start getting to COVID, geopolitical goes away. I mean, sure, the United States and China are fussing, but what the heck, they fuss all the time. A couple of things going on that I think may be problematic. One is that I think we're seeing a, a rise in nationalism and autarky. Countries want to draw more and more into themselves. That's fine, 
But remember that one of the things that globalization did was lower prices for consumer goods significantly around the world, as well as create middle classes where they hadn't existed before. So if we go towards nationalism and autarky, you are talking about significant damage to nascent middle classes and to poor people, people who can't afford the damage to begin with. American democracy is going to continue to fragment and flail, uh, as we've seen. Um, and remember that that is not sui generis. Those schisms exist, but they are being uh, augmented by significant adversary action, which is uh, a part of a conflict that so far our adversaries have proven to be far more effective at than the United States or Europe for that matter. Uh, Russia does excellent um, uh, weaponized narrative and disinformation campaigns. And the idea that uh, American elections have been unaffected by this since 2016 uh, is a comforting uh, narrative, but it's probably not true. Uh, and it's certainly not going to be true in 2020. Uh, the election, for the first time in my memory, uh, this election offers a small but non-trivial potential for loss of legitimacy and civil war. That civil war will be in part designed and deployed by adversaries of the United States. The best way to render a country that is giving you trouble when you're trying to expand your sphere of influence, uh, to render it helpless, is to create conditions of civil war in that country. India. China, Russia may all be on different sides when it comes to who they hope wins the election, but they all want to see Americans involved um, in civil wars internally that keep us too tied up and busy to be able to continue to serve as a global uh, policeman. Uh, that may or may not be good. That depends entirely on your political perspective. One of the significant weapons that the United States has had since the end of the Cold War, it is now essentially lost. And that is the soft power uh, that characterized it. Uh, America has always been attractive uh, to people around the world, in part because of the freedom it offers, uh, the economic opportunity, uh, the education, uh, all of that, of course, has been significantly undermined in the last four years. COVID, where the United States has flailed around like a banana republic, uh, has simply been the icing on the cake. The result is that the most powerful long-term strategic advantage of the United States has been essentially destroyed by COVID and by uh, the mismanagement that occurred before that. Whether or not that was uh, deliberate uh, is an interesting question, which can't be answered with a lot, without a lot of information, which is very heavily classified. Uh, and finally, um, the frustrations that continue to arise from COVID and will continue to arise because COVID is not like flu. It's not going to get fixed just because you have an injection every October, uh, not in the near future. Uh, that's going to continue to fuel civic unrest and violence. Any idea that we have that we're going to return to normalcy, I think, um, is a wistful fantasy, but has very little basis in current events. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's about the cheerful news. This is just showing you disinformation keeps rolling. We know that. Uh, I think with that, probably, um, uh, we will just uh, exit and go back. Great. So again, if you have questions, go ahead and start putting them into the to the Q and A. Um, in the meantime, to to get us started, Brad, you you ended by um, saying that that there is no return to uh, normal. Right. And I'm curious for Brad and for David, your thoughts on, on, on what that, what, what does that really mean? What, what I see this weekend, I, I ran some errands and every restaurant was packed to the, uh, you know, to the walls. There was, there was very little, um, 
effort to social distance or anything else. And I'm wondering how much of this is, is people's desire to return to normal. It's their desire to put it all to the side for, for a moment and just have a beer with friends, have a glass of wine with a nice dinner and just return to normal. It's not about political agendas or mask wearing or not, right. but I just want it to be back to the good old days. Right. And I think the answer to that is um, it's over. We're not going to get back to the good old days. There's too many major systems that have been perturbed too significantly. Um, I think that the effects will be seen slowly enough so that we may not wake up one morning and say, holy mackerel, everything's changed. You know, changes in the commercial property market are not going to be immediately visible to you and I. But I think over time, we're going to look back on COVID and realize that it was a longer, more fundamental um, uh, attack on the Bastille. And it worked. Yeah, uh, and at the same time, uh, that doesn't mean that there are things that we are going to, to take back, you know, like uh, we are going to go back to, to be with friends and, you know, have more physical contact. I think that's, that's not over. What is over is uh, many other things that, you know, COVID is, is sharing down. And I think the attitude towards that is that they weren't that good to start with. Uh, it, it might have been painful because change is always painful. But many of the things that we are losing uh, are good, uh, are a good prudence. And I, I think that uh, we need to, to pick an attitude of being open to, to that while also not associating that with having lost the ability to, to be with our friends in physically. Right? Yeah, and let me follow up on what David just said. There are, there are things we can control, like going back with our friends and recreating our lives, which I think he's absolutely right. That will happen at some point eventually just because we're human. Then I think there, there's things that are going to happen that we really don't know. Things like how the city is going to change with the impact of all of the technology, all of the social change, all of the cultural demands. Um, uh, is it going to hollow out because the commercial market falls apart and the money goes to the suburbs? None of us really know. But there are ways of trying to muddle through effectively and ways of just totally screwing it up. And hopefully what we do when we think about the kinds of things that David and I are talking about is not simply throw up our hands. Hopefully what we do is commit to trying to muddle through, but to do it as rationally and effectively and humanely as we possibly can. And to do that, you've got to face certain truths like there's a lot of things built into COVID that could really screw um, uh, uh, minority, low income, and, and other disempowered uh, populations. And if we don't pay attention to that, bad things are going to happen. So building on this, there's a question from, from Adam. He asks, how will the polyverse of worldviews in the U.S. shape the revolutionary opportunity of COVID? How can sustainability scientists help navigate the conflicting narratives that accompany this revolutionary time? Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll answer and then David can be optimistic. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we know that yet. I mean, it's hard for us to accept but sustainability is one narrative among many. And like most narratives, it can result in a bubble that leads us to come up with a lot of good ideas that don't necessarily mesh with what's going on outside the window. So I think that one of the things that, that we need to do, and that a place like ASU is pretty effective at if it puts its mind to it, is we need to make sure that while we're thinking all of our good thoughts inside academia, we're also coupling to that world out there in ways that are effective and helpful. And we don't do that very well at all. Well, I, I threw uh, this idea of, of, um, of pluriverse and as something positive, because um, my, my point is that uh, 
what we have created up to now uh, was based on uh, the idea of the universe, right? We have been in a homogenizing process um, since the last, for the last 500 years or, or more, right? And, and I, I think that that's, uh, that some people might think that that's necessary because otherwise it's chaos, right? But uh, because I'm more optimistic about the human, human nature and the human condition, I think that we, we just need to learn to live with plural perspective. It, it's okay that we all have different views of reality. We don't need, someone was asking, if we don't share a view of reality, do we have a country? Well, perhaps you don't have a country, perhaps you don't need a country, right? Because we have to start um, learning to live in, in this planet, the one planet, with different ways of approaching reality, completely uh, sometimes incompatible, and be okay with, with that. We don't need to kill each other because of that or, or try to impose uh, our own view on the others because we feel so insecure if others have a, a different view of, of reality. Having said that, of course, this is optimistic uh, and uh, until we get to that point, a lot of suffering will need to happen and confusion and all that. But uh, the question is whether we give up on the possibility of living together peacefully in a blue universe or, or just uh, assume that the universal perspective is the only way to, to, to proceed, right? Well, and, and following up on David's comments, flip that back. One of the things that I think COVID may be encouraging is the increasing fitness in a governance sense of soft authoritarianism over pluralism. The, the challenge that David raises, which, which I would rephrase in sort of my insensitive gross way as how could you build an exceptionalist narrative for a society that could hold together with multiple realities, some of which are mutually exclusive, right? How would you build a new exceptionalist narrative for the United States, as badly fragmented as it is? Could you even think of doing that? If you can't, you'd better learn to speak Mandarin. I think the, uh, the New Yorker <laughs> yeah, last- and also that, sorry. Uh, I was no, just going to say, I think the New Yorker last week had an article to this effect, very pessim pessimistic view of what David just said, that that we are, are um, living in multiple different realities and that the United States is no longer because of that. Sorry, go ahead, David. Hmm. But, uh, but, but in, in practical terms, uh, I think, um, of course, the elections won't, won't take us there, right? <laughs> um, but the social movements that we are seeing uh, emerging that uh, are at least trying to address issues like colonialism, because this is, this is of course, at the, at the root of, of the colonial mentality and you know, the, co the colonial cognitive approach is one in which there can only be one view of reality, right? And that's hence uh, some people think that science is, is, uh, has this colonial bias and built in, right? You know, or at least some types of, of scientific uh, approaches. So uh, I think uh, there is a lot of hope in terms of, of these movements that are uh, framing the, the problem and the issue in terms of decolonizing. And uh, I'm not saying it will be easier or, you know, or, or clean, <laughs> it won't be a clean process. But we're seeing movement in that direction already. The optimistic again is, of course, in me. <laughs> so um, then, moving moving on from this, there's a question from Aaron um, about open and closed societies, and and he asks, due to the spread of the disease and increasing individual time alone in isolation, working from home, etc. Uh, will we see individuals become more individualistic, uh, more closed borders, decreased globalization, more nationalism, etc.? So I think there's I think there's two levels to that question. Um, am I am I coming over? Can you hear me? Okay. I think there's two levels to that question. One is the the sort of short term impact on people who will have grown up without that sense of isolation. And I think there, to David's point, there's always going to be something pulling you back. The longer term, I think, is much more challenging. Uh, what we know 
from the things we've learned in disinformation warfare and weaponized narrative, Cambridge Analytica, um, uh, uh, behavioral economics, uh, culture studies, we've begun to learn how to turn human identity into a design space. Once that happens, all of the assumptions that underlie questions like that about what it means to be human are no longer fixed, they're contingent. And they're contingent on the activity of well-educated, very smart postmodern adversaries who are able to manipulate those senses of identity to create the political and socioeconomic outcomes that they prefer. So I think that the problem is, once you get to a certain point, the way the evolution of technology and our knowledge base is taking us, the idea that the individual is somehow privileged in terms of his or her ability to understand and respond rationally to the world is going to fail. And once it fails, then I think you've got a ballpark none of us understand. Well, I'll, I'll take a different angle perhaps, but uh, uh, I think it's important not to confuse individualism with uh, connectivity. And, and what we have seen actually with all these media, uh, social media, is that uh, being more connected doesn't make you less individualistic. It, it actually can be the other way around. Uh, so what is uh, what does it mean to combat individualism, which by, by the way, is not something that COVID really is, is the main responsible for. It's, it's just the whole social system, including education and, and many other institutions that we have created that promote this individualism. But uh, what, uh, what COVID uh, actually can, can make against individualism is the, that by First, by not being able to connect physically, we may appreciate more, um, uh, let's say, deep, deep connection, right? Versus the more virtual type, type of connectivity. But second, uh, the, the way we can combat individualism is by connecting to ourselves, which is, you know, it's, uh, again, being, being, being connected to other people uh, is not a, a deep, true connection unless we have the ability to connect to ourselves. Then we can connect to other people in a, in, in a true way. And the problem is that culturally, we don't cultivate this ability to connect with, with ourselves and with ourselves in relation to, to, to the world, right? So I, I think that's why part of my opti optimism come uh, that uh, COVID-19 has, uh, at least for me and for many, many people I know, uh, has forced people to really connect to oneself, to recognize the fact of their isolation. You know, we are isolated uh, beings in, in a sense, and uh, stay with that, no, and and be okay with that, and not ne not don't need to compulsory create uh, shallow connections, but really have a more a more deeper sense of of uh, of uh, what connection means. It's a little bit convoluted, but, but I hope it made sense. So to, to, to build on that, there's a question here from Arizona Bone Doc. Um, COVID has prompted rapid progress in viral analysis and treatment. Isn't this a force to promote a return to normal socialization? Why, why can't we just go back to normal? Well, I think that, that in terms of individual uh, connectivity. Hopefully we will be able to at some point. I mean, you know, the ideal would be uh, COVID appears to be, a, I mean, COVID's a really interesting little bug. It's fascinating. But, um, but it's a bear, right? I mean, the things it does to blood, I mean, just, you know, whoa. Um, but if we can find a vaccine that is you know, even a flu vaccine type thing, you know, every October you get a COVID vaccination and, and there's some, there's some mortality at the edges, but we, we integrate it into the way we live. I think we can get back to that sort of person to person. I think where we're going to see major change over time is that a lot of the institutions that have been somewhat zombie, uh, uh, and, but, but with huge inertia, I mean, changing higher education, is is almost impossible. It's so flippin' big. 
But I think that those institutions are going to begin to change and for a large part fail and new institutions will arise. Uh, and that's going to change, I think, the world. Normal in terms of person to person, perhaps. Normal in terms of the world's going to look the way it did uh, in 2015. We're not going to see that again. Well, um, in, a, in a sense, uh, we, we have to ask also why it's so uncomfortable for us to be disconnected for a couple of years <laughs> or, or to not be able, you know. Why, why is it so tough? Why we cannot handle it? Why it's such a big deal, right? And, and should it be such a big deal? If you have to, you, I mean, and of course, we are, if, we, if you are used to instant ple uh, pleasure and, and the instant satisfac satisfaction of your desires, then it's gonna be very difficult to, to, do, to restrain uh, these desires in any way. But uh, perhaps we need to work on, on on, on this uh, you know, need that we have uh, created about uh, satisfying our desires immediately all the time. And that works also for climate change. It's not, you know, so COVID could be just like a boot camp for, for that, right? So one, uh, I wanna get back to this question from, from Alan. Uh, do you think there will be more emphasis in funding uh, placed on public health? Only 1% of our budget is going towards public health. Do you think this is going to change? Well, that depends on how cynical you are about politics. Um, I think that some aspects of it will change. What I would like to see change is I think that, I think that the public health system is a very, very complex infrastructure but that if you think about it in, term, in systemic terms, we could do a lot better than certainly what we've done. And so the question is not just, shouldn't we think about more investment in public health? The question is, should we be thinking more about how to turn what we've got into a more resilient, effective system? And there's ways to do that that, that essentially are is a much longer discussion than we have time for here. I think a deeper question is, what constitutes public health? And, and when we answer that question, we've not only got to think about the communities that aren't being served well today, um, we've got to think about the fact that um, there's geopolitical competition that is going to be driving a lot of development, which is going to be uh, location specific or culture specific and the gap both within countries and states and between countries and states between the haves and the have nots is liable to get much larger. We talk a lot about sustainability and the idea of egalitarianism that has to be accompanied by a firm grip on the knowledge that that's not the way the world is going and it's certainly not the way COVID is pushing us. I think Brad answer. Okay, um, I want to move on to this question uh, from Philip. He asks, Brad, can you expand on the concept that privacy is a middle class luxury good? And then Brad and David, to what extent might having more individual rights and access to privacy be making us more individualistic in a potentially excessive or normatively negative way? Sure. So if you think about it, we tend, to, we tend to view privacy as a human right. Um, that's, that's the framing that you get most often when people talk about privacy. But, but privacy is a very modern development. Uh, when you were in the Middle Ages or you were living in a, in a Chinese village in, in um, the 12 or 1300s, you had no privacy. You had one room, everything happened in one room, the house next door to you is right next door to you. There was no such thing. We began to develop the idea of privacy first uh, with the idea that you could begin to build bigger and bigger houses and the richer you were, the more you could build away all of the masses from your doorstep. Uh, 
And then secondly, with the idea that came out of a decision by Justice Douglas, uh, which found privacy partially because he wanted to get to a certain decision on abortion. So privacy is a construct. Now, what we've done is we've reified that construct to the point where when we say privacy, we no longer ask, what is that costing? So for example, um, one of the problems with introducing any kind of tracing in Western Europe and the United States for COVID is the argument about privacy. Well, you're imposing on my privacy. Uh, this is usually said by people who have already given away all their privacy to private firms through the way they use their electronics, but let's not, let's not ask for, for um, a lack of cognitive dissonance in human affairs. What that does, though, is that means that when you get into an area like health, where everything is, is uh, uh, constrained by privacy regulations, efforts to try to respond, for example, in COVID, to do tracing to save lives, are stymied by privacy, and nobody adds up the cost of what that does. Now, the problem with that is that the privacy that we so value, to the extent it exists at all anymore, tends to accrue to people that can afford it. It does not accrue to people in, say, the inner city or in certain rural areas, people who don't have the, the assets to buy privacy. And they're the people that are being affected most by COVID. So the challenge is, can we get anything that passes the privacy test politically, because whether you think privacy is right or not, it is a political force and you have to deal with it. And yet at the same time, helps us respond better, particularly uh, in communities that are suffering the most impact from COVID, which are the poor, uh, the people of color and, and those communities. In, in, in Arizona, for example, and certainly the Native Americans, Navajo Nation has taken a terrible hit. Yeah, so both uh, privacy and rights are, are constructs, as uh, Brad was saying, that uh, make sense in the context of individualistic uh, ideology. So the answer is yes. Uh, the more we reify these constructs, uh, both rights and, and privacy, the more we are um, giving support to this ideology. If, if um, you agree with me that the, the root of all these uh, issues that we are discussing is precisely the, the dominance of individualistic ideology over, over other types of ideology, then we need to find ways of uh, satisfying justice or, or other without, cons without constructs like rights. And this requires that we create, that we detox ourselves from our individualistic uh, assumptions and start seeing ourselves as connected beings, as you know, part of the planet, part of societies and things like that. So deconstruct the individualistic ideology, the idea that uh, we are independent somehow, you know, we are dropping this planet, but uh, what happens in the planet is not directly affecting us or things like that. And, uh, and we need to also look at uh, indigenous uh, cultures, uh, at uh, non-Western perspectives that, uh, you know, they have been um, applying uh, justice or thing or other other uh, without these these types of constructs right and and uh, i'm not saying that they are always better or that we have to just throw away these constructs but we have to understand them for what they are they are a construct in the context of a particular ideology and there are alternative ideologies and we have to discuss uh, on a almost uh, case by case basis what what type of ideology we want to bring to the table right So we have uh, an, another question here from, from Edward about systems. He said, so our grocery store supply chain ramps up during the first few months of COVID. Everyone has $600 uh, uh, weekly stimulus uh, brought in. People are spending that money. Now uh, we, we don't have the stimulus going forward for the moment at least. Uh, so grocery stores are cutting their prices to try to keep their customers. Uh, do we see problems with this going forward? Are the grocery stores going to go bankrupt? Then what happens to the supply chains Brad had referenced earlier? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, so this gets a little into the concept of resilience. The, the supply chains we have have been remarkably resilient up until now. But what you do, I worked in, in private industry for, for 20 years. What you do when you get hard times is you make the adjustments you need to survive. So that's what the grocery stores are doing. That's what, you know, that's what the bars are doing. That's what the restaurants are doing. Everybody's trying to do that. The problem is almost by definition, there's a point at which your ability to do that fails and you just collapse. So what we're doing now is we're playing on the resilience that was already in the system and it's keeping that grocery store going for now. But you're absolutely right. At some point, the adjustments that store is making uh, are simply going to overwhelm its fundamental uh, ability to exist and that store is gonna shut down. Uh, and that's gonna happen across the economy uh, as we begin to run out of resilience. I think there's, there's really not a very good understanding of how much on edge a lot of our system is and how much we don't want it to go over that last edge and fail completely. Yeah, and the reason why we didn't go to, through the edge is because of government intervention, clearly, right? And, yep. and the discovery that uh, if you print your own money, you can spend as much as, as you can, right? as you want, or, or as you can, as long as the inflation doesn't, doesn't go up, right? And uh, of course, there are ideologies preventing um, this idea to be implemented, the government can spend as much as they, as they want, you know, there is all this idea that you, then you have to collect the tax and deficits and all that. But in reality, that's not the case. So whether shops are going to, to you know, the small businesses or other grocery sh shops are going to, to, to close and collapse will depend on how much we are able to overcome this ideology uh, uh, that there are constraints imposed by deficits <laughs> you know uh, instead what we have to do is to realize that we which is up for us to choose what fails and what doesn't fail right? and um, we have a much more power to design the system than the market uh, ideology kind of uh, suggests that's the way i see it at least so we have just a couple minutes left. I guess as a concluding question, I would love to hear from both of you what you would like to see going forward. David, do you want to take that first? <laughs> well, um, I think uh, I'm not very much concerned about COVID-19. I think uh, it's, uh, it's bad, but in comparison to, to what is coming, <laughs> in terms of climate change. I think that we will stop talking about COVID-19 because uh, the fires in California, the Amazon forest probably, you know, flipping into a, a savanna type of ecosystems with all the changes in oceanic currents that this may generate, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, many hurricanes, I mean, climate change is here and it's, it's uh, moving faster than, than anyone, I think, expected. So I think that um, that's, that's what is coming and, and dealing with that, uh, I mean, we're going to forget COVID-19 very, very rapidly in five years or so. It will be all about climate change and it will be all about, uh, forget about going back to normality or things like that. It will be all about how we, how we re redesign um, our, the whole systems that we, that we have created for the last uh, hundred years and that are clearly the cause of, of these changes in, in, in climate. I'm optimistic in the sense of um, b believing that we have the capacity to redesign ourselves and that I see climate change basically as just one, um, one opportunity for us to, or to force us to, to do that. But of course, I, I also acknowledge that a lot of suffering and, and you know, lots of people are going to, to be affected by this very negatively. And uh, that's almost inevitable. So yeah, um, the most important thing is to is to acknowledge the situation, right? Uh, acknowledge that uh, that all these changes are, are coming. 
So the excess of positivity might be a, a huge enemy <laughs> for for us at this point. Yeah. And I guess I'd say in the short term, I would like to see Western democracies try to rebuild their soft power because if they can become attractive, it will be because they have managed all of the problems that we see today on our streets in the COVID response. Um, and I think that can be done, but I think it requires much more sensitivity to, um, to moving away from sort of the, the combination of individualism and tribalism that has acted to make identity a source of civil war within the United States and within other democracies too. I mean, the UK, for example. But in the longer term, I think the challenge is, is amazing. I mean, we now live on the first terraform planet, far as we know, anywhere in the universe. Uh, we have no idea what we're doing. I'd like to see us begin to work on that. I mean, climate change in some ways is important, but in some ways it's only the first beginning of the recognition that human activity now determines how this planet operates. Not just climate, the oceans, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the human cycles, it's all part of the same thing. The, the division between nature and human is artificial. It's fundamentally artificial. You want stability in both systems. How do we do that? How do we manage a terraform planet? How do we justify being a sentient species? That's our fundamental challenge. Great. Thank you both for taking the time to share with us today. This was, as always, a fascinating and enlightening uh, discussion. I very much appreciated it on behalf of all of our uh, attendees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care and have a wonderful day. You too.